You know, I've been on the verge of suicide twice. You know, when I was going through a massive divorce, I'm an Indian guy that, you know, Indian people don't get divorced. That's not what we do. It's not the, the norm for our culture. And I realized this. And every one of us, if you ask yourself this question, if you go, and I studied it because I was like, why am I here? What, how did I get here? And the only, from all of the deduction I can do, and I can't say this as a 100% statement, I can say, but I can say it as a strong 99.9%. The only reason we think about suicide is because we feel we're out of control in our life and the only thing we have control of is taking our life. Welcome to the Better Human Podcast. My name is Greg Witz and each week we're going to be bringing you some incredible and inspiring guests and topics that are going to take your life to the next level. Thanks for spending time with us. Sit back and enjoy the show. Dr. T, aka Dr. Rewire, welcome to the show, man. I'm super excited to have this conversation with you today. Greg, I am as well. Thanks for having me and I appreciate it. Well, there's no one better to have this conversation because we're living in this world of change and we're trying to grow and we're trying to learn. And we're also, you know, inundated and overwhelmed with things like stress and anxiety. So what I really hope to get out of today's episode is some advice and some guidance on what we could do in quotations to rewire our brain. Uh, and more importantly, you know, is this stuff even manageable and learnable? Sure. So the first question I want to kick off with is considering we're living in this world of stress, we're seeing this heightened anxiety, right? I mean, everyone is overloaded with anxiety. Where do you think this stuff is coming from? And, and maybe the follow-up question, which I'll remind you is, is what do we do about this? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, and, and, you know, we do live in a world of anxiety, but let me also just make a, probably a statement that people didn't realize is that we've always had anxiety. We just now are more aware of it. Like it's always been there. We just never called it that, right? Like before we would call it fear, we'd call it, you know, stressed out or maybe some palpitations, but we wouldn't sit and say that, oh my God, like I remember at 14 years old, right, Greg, I had an anxiety when I was going to a new school. I remember very clearly, but we didn't call it anxiety. We didn't call it this. Now we've just put a label to it so that everyone now experiences now they're saying, okay, well, here's a big thing. So, but really where it all stems from is one word. It's really one word and that's fear. All anxiety stems from the idea of fear, and we're just afraid of what the future has to tell us. Because most people sit and think that, okay, well, I'm anxious, and I want to get rid of anxiety. And I'll tell you honestly, Greg, it's, it's a foolish idea because you're never going to get rid of anxiety. It's not about getting rid of anxiety. It's about learning to manage it and remove it. But if we realize that it's the fear that's making us anxious, what if we just disabled the fear? Then anxiety disappears. That's really the work that I do. And that's how I help rewire an anxiety. And you can do this in minutes. It doesn't have to take a long time or at least, you know, 30, 40 minutes. You can rewire it and not have to deal with that fear again. Yeah. So I want to come back to the rewiring because it's, it's what you just said there is it's easy to rewire. But, you know, my follow up is like, we, how, how do we strengthen that new neurological connection, that new wire? Right. Sure. But you said something, you know, when we grew up or well, back in the day, we didn't call it anxiety. It was fear. Right. And, you know, fear is normal and and being nervous and, and anxious was normal. In fact, we also know that excitement and anxiety is the exact same emotion in a lot of cases. Right. It's just the perception of the outcome that becomes a little bit different. So do you think that maybe as society, because we've labeled it and we put so much sort of, you know, emphasis on, on, on anxiety, it's, it's become like a, like the common cold for people, right? Like, oh, I have a cold, I can't come to work today. It is. It, it's, you know, in my opinion, like I'll say some statements that probably piss some people off, but I'll, I'll be very honest with it. It's that like we've used, and I'm not saying people don't struggle with mental health by any means. I'm not saying that, right. but I think what we've done is we've oversensitized our entire environment around it. Where, where people were learned to deal with challenges. Now, I think you're giving children too much of an, a leeway to say, hey, look, I'm just anxious. I'm just anxious. And, and that's a reason for me not to go to school, not to deal with my challenges. We made the people emotionally inept to be able to learn to manage their own fear. What we say is we need a personal health day or a personal mental day. Great. But what are you doing with that? Most people, what they do is when they take a mental health day is they disappear. They don't do any real work on their brain. They just sit and lay in bed and they re or they sleep. That's perpetuating depression behavior. Right. So that's not really helping people in society to get further ahead of it. Now, if you're doing work to help analyze the fears, what's really going on, that's a whole different animal, right? Inside that. But I think that as people, as society grows, and we did just call it fear, but fear is just normal. It's part of life. It's part of the things that we have to deal with. As individuals grow and become adults, I have two teenagers, um, and my daughter just starting college. And it's like, if they don't learn to manage fear in their life, they're always going to live in a state of anxiety. And, 
Anxiety in itself is debilitating because you don't understand what's going on with your body. Once we understand it, we know how to navigate it. It doesn't have to be something that regulates your life. Okay, so so let's go there. So so okay. explain what happens to your body. I mean, we got our amygdala that's starting to fire, that that fear, that fight or flight kicks in, which as we just described is very normal, but maybe we over sensationalize that where now it's become a crutch for people. And also just as a caveat, there is a difference between being diagnosed with severe anxiety and depression versus labeling or calling myself or describing my feelings and fear right now as anxiety. And I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and that's a great distinction too, Greg. I'm not talking about the ones that are clinically, you know, just they, they can't, they're so, you know, immobile. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the everyday person that's just kind of struggling, you know, navigating through it and using maybe drugs to manage it. If you can get rid of it, then you don't have to, right? Like the, when you get anxious, I remember when I was, I don't know, it's five, seven years ago, I had a major panic attack and I didn't know what it was, but I felt like I was having this heart attack. My heart race raced, my heart rate, excuse me, my heart started to race, blood pressure went up, started to sweat, started feeling shortness of breath, all these things. And you think you're having a heart attack, but it was an anxiety attack. What it was, it was that I was in a very stressful period of my life and I had to deal with it. And I literally was afraid of the future of what the outcome was going to be. And so I knew that was going on. And I knew that's exactly what's happening. All of us, when we have a little bit of stress or anxiousness, we feel it in our stomach. It's called our mesenteric nervous system. We feel it in our stomach because that's our primal place of fear. So there, you can't have anxiety without stomach, your stomach being issued so, or so stomach being contracted. One of the physical sort of, you know, things that I can start to recognize, which is, you know, it starts in the stomach, right? That's right. And then if you notice, you can have shortness of breath. And anxiety shortens your breath. And when you get lack of oxygen into the system, what's happening is that the body doesn't breathe oxygen and it starts to panic. So the first thing to do is if you're in the middle of an anxiety attack is stop and breathe. I mean, it sounds so simple. It's like, I can't breathe. No, but that's why if you've seen it, right? People put the, the bag that when they're hyperventilating and that, they're, ble they're breathing in oxygen, they're recycling it. But if you just stop yourself and take full control of what's going on, First, you know, as therapists and, and that have called it, you name it. Say, I'm fearful right now, and that's okay. And then take 10 deep breaths, in for six, in for seven, hold for seven, and out for seven. That anxiety attack is not going to last. Right, right. And, and I love what you just said there. First, identify it, describe it, define it, name it call it because when all of a sudden you make it a thing it becomes more tangible for us to sort of process right like i could start to wrap my head around it right i could start to i could start to reorganize myself around it versus having this thing that's in, in the abyss it's just this sort of you know mystical thing that i'm feeling right now correct it is and you guys know this and you know this as well greg is that when we don't have clarity the brain just goes into chaos Right. So that, that's why naming it is so clearly, it's like, oh, okay, here's what I'm experiencing. We get clarity in the brain. The brain says, this is fear. Okay. Now that if you really can be aware and cognitive enough, I would sit and say, what am I afraid of? Mm -hmm. Right. In, the, in that moment, can you stop yourself and say, what am I actually afraid of? And name that and understand it. And it's like, oh, okay. Then you can sit and say, what is the fear? Is that really a fear? Is that really going to be the outcome? If you, it's, we all have these metacognitive conversations in our brain when the amygdala has taken over. So if we can actually have that conversation and say, is that real? Mm -hmm. Is that really, really going to happen? Or is that something I'm making up in my head? I tell you what, that conversation changes. Right, right. In fact, what you're talking about is really activating that frontal lobe in that moment, right? Because in the state of fear and anxiousness and the amygdala is firing, fight or flight, right? If we don't do anything, right, it takes its course, but we have to sort of pause. And that's where breathing kicks in. So describing it, finding it to start to take that breath. And you said it was seven in, hold for six. Hold, seven in, hold for seven, out for seven. Okay. Yeah. Right. And there's many different breathing exercises, but the, the exercise of there's a difference between hyperventilating where people think they're breathing and they've stopped breathing, right? They're, they're short breathing. Yep. This is the deep inhale and the exhale through the mouth and out the nose. Is that important? Right. The difference between mouth and nose. It is. I like, I like in through the nose, out through the mouth. Right. And the reason I say sevens is this is my work is more designed around balancing the brain rather than just you know, just challenging it necessarily. So if we breathe in for seven on inspiration, we hold for seven, we allow the oxygen receptors and the carbon dioxide receptors to rebalance themselves in the system. And then you breathe out for seven, you're letting the parasympathetic nervous system now regulate. So it's balanced between the sympathetic and parasympathetic so that they breathe in, in harmony. 
Awesome. You know, I was once, um, my father passed away 2012 and I was in a state of anxiousness and stress afterwards. I mean, there was, sure. a, there was a lot of like, all right, well, what's life going to be in the business and all this stuff. Right. So I was with the psychologist and, you know, he hooked me up to this little machine. I don't know what it was, but a little thing on my ear with a wire into his computer. And he said, all right, talk to me. And as I was talking, he flipped the computer around and my, my graph were, it looked peaked in valleys, like spikes all over the place. And he says, all right, I want you to do this breathing exercise, which was very similar to yours. He just did it on the count of four, five, four. Sure. Um, and he, and of course, this first time I was ever introduced to really breathing and, and, and managing it and fast forward this as I'm going through this. And, and of course, I'm trying to analyze, well, how long should I breathe for? And what's a deep breath? And he's like, just fucking stop and breathe. And I was like, okay, cool. And I, and, and I did it and he flipped the machine around and my line was flat. And what he yeah. explained to me was breathing will rest your nervous system. It's the sure. thing that starts to bring calm. And as you said, you start to align those two systems there. Amazing. Well, it's a yogis, right? Greg, back in the day, the yogis used to say, so, go, so goes the breath, so goes the mind. Hmm. And so if the breath is imbalanced, your mind is imbalanced. Right. So goes the breath, so goes the mind. That's an awesome mm -hmm. line. That's yeah. Amazing line. So um, I want to come back to, um, you know, us as parents. Um, so what do you think? I mean, back to society, have we, have we softened our, our kids? Have we become softer because of that whole concept of originally helicopter parenting and helicopter parenting into snowplow parenting, which, which is let me remove resistance and obstacle from people. And I don't want my kids or my team or my spouse or my friend to be stressed. So therefore I'm going to swoop in. I'm going to remove all the stress. And it's become problematic because stress helps, right? Not prolonged stress, but stress is actually very developmental. Yeah, you need to, right? So like, here's where I think it all, all went downhill. And, you know, many psychologists will argue with me, but I'm happy to talk about it from a neurophysiologic standpoint, is this whole idea of positive thinking. The mm -hmm. positive thinking movement has destroyed our, our, our mental health because we can't always be positive. We can't always be happy. We can't always be you know, in a great state, like that's not reality. Like the human body works with feedback mechanisms and sadness is a mechanism of happiness. You know, right is a good of wrong. Like it's all in, in complementary opposites. And if I said to somebody that you're happy all the time, Greg, you're, if I said to you, you're happy all the time, you're gonna say, no, I'm not. If I said you're sad all the time, even someone who's super depressed, clinically depressed, if I said to them, you're sad and depressed all the time, they're gonna say, no, I'm not. But if I said, you know, sometimes you're happy and sometimes you're sad, sometimes you you feel great, and sometimes you feel like crap, they're going to say, you know what, that's probably a little bit more realistic because we're a balance of both. Right. We're a balance of both systems in our body and our, and our mind and body have to realize that. But the more we became this idea of positive thinking, we've, we've set up depression as a mechanism. And I'm going to look at it from a holistic perspective and saying depression is not a disease. It's a normal feedback. There's articles that are proving that depression is a normal state of the brain that comes in when you're over addicted to high levels of dopamine, the serotonin drops off and you have to hit the bottom on the other side. Correct. Absolutely. You know, I'll give the example of, um, uh, of um, uh, drugs, right? Mm -hmm. Ecstasy. You know, most people, when they would do ecstasy, you know, a couple of days later, they're extremely depressed because of exactly that. They were so hot, right? Yeah. And, and their system was depleted. And I totally agree with you. The, the world of positive thinking, the world of, of, oh, everything is warm and fuzzy. And we even see this in parents, right? Which is my child must feel and experience positivity all the time. You know, my kid said the other day, he's like, dad, I'm bored. And I'm like, good. It's normal to be bored. Go use right. your imagination, right? And that's right. We, we've robbed that from our kids, which is, you know, the, 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 the blissfulness and the developmentalness of, uh, of being bored. All right, let's flip back to some, some brain stuff. So talk to me, is it possible for us to rewire our brain? I know you you're, you're called Dr. Rewire and, yeah. and, and that's the, the, the work you do, but just explain that to us. How does it, it work? Is. How can we well, do it? It is. And, and your listeners on this podcast know this well, if they're interested, like, right? right. I came from a world of, of clinical practice and I saw how the mind body work together. And I started to ask different questions to help heal the body. But then I started taking it into business application. I started taking it into entrepreneurship and I started taking it into different um, levels inside that. And I started using it in different formats, but yes, every, everything can be rewired. Every single thing in the brain can be rewired. Here's the interesting thing, right? 
if you're alive, your brain is creating new neurons. And one of the most important things that nobody talks about in longevity, and I'll share it with you here, is do new things. New things constantly. Take new actions. Because if you live the same repetitive pattern again and again and again and again, you don't create neuroplasticity. You don't create new neurogenesis in the body, or it's just creating of new neurons. And what you do is you actually just allow that same pathway. It's like, I like thinking about it this way. It's like if we're, you and I were hiking in Costa Rica, right? And you're probably more of a hiker than I am by any means, right? But if you're just walking the same path again and again, thousands of people walk that path, you can see clearly where that path goes. Mm -hmm. And the brain says, okay, I just know that's the only way that I know to go. And it does that. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort. doesn't take a whole lot of work. It's just fine. It is what it is. And I'll just take that path. However, until someone new comes along and says, you know what, what if I went down this path and created a new trail? Now that brain says, oh, wait, I have to work again. We have to put stress on the system and it creates a new trail and you're blazing through. Then another person comes along and then another person comes along. That's slowly called the process of myelination and neurogenesis, doing something again that's different, right? The first time a child, I'm trying to think of my son when the first time he's a big soccer player. The first time they kick the ball, they don't know what they're doing. Right. But you do it again and again and again and again. And then the brain says, oh, yeah, I remember how to do this. And then it does it without even – that's what's called not thinking. Right. And it just does an unconsciousness. It's a habit at that point. But it's habits are dangerous if we don't create new neural patterns inside of our body. It is – you know, you could listen to all these podcasts, and I do. I'm, I'm addicted to them, like probably like you are, right, and how to perform better. It's like you can listen to all the blood work and Peter Tia and, and, and Huberman and all these guys are fantastic. They give all this stuff. But the one thing they're leaving out of the equation, the one thing they're not bringing in the conversation is neurogenesis of the brain because everything starts and ends here no matter what. That's amazing. You know, we have a saying which is your neurological pathways become your neurological highways. That's right. Right. And if you're not careful, right, your highway goes in the wrong direction, right? You just keep working that path. Does this apply to things like feelings and emotions and, and, and re like reactions? Like, let's say, you know, you're, you're arguing with your spouse and it's just, you're, you're on that same path by doing something different in the moment. It actually gives me an opportunity to change that behavior or change that feeling. Is that, is that correct? It can, it can, if you're aware enough in, in the middle of it, right? In the middle of it, if you can stop yourself. But most of us, when we get, let's say you're having a discussion with your wife and it becomes a heated argument, right? Or, or your husband, whoever's listening for that matter, right? When you're in that heated argument, it's not you that's responding. It's your amygdala responding. Right. And your amygdala is responding from something that's happened, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. It triggers that response and Brian says, oh, wait, I remember this pathway. I didn't like the way it felt. Here's the emotion I had. It was bad. It was mad. It was sad. It was. And then so what you do is your format goes anger. And your reaction goes, I'm not going back to that, what I call a root experience. So anger becomes a mechanism. And now during that discussion, it's no longer a discussion. You're really that four-year-old or the five-year-old child who's arguing. And they're the four-year, five-year-old child that's arguing. And you now have two four-year-olds that are arguing back and forth. And that's why if you think about it, right, and, and Greg, I'm sure you're, you've done this and I've done this as well. In the middle of the argument, after you're done, you're like, I can't even believe like what I was arguing about. I remember I'd say to myself, Greg, I'd sit and say, I know I'm angry right now and I know I'm not even acting the way that I'm supposed to, but I'm just saying this, all this stuff, but this is not me. This is my four-year-old. Allow me just to say what I need to, to get done with the argument, mm -hmm. but it's not really how I totally feel. Right, right. You know, you're describing what happened last night with me and my wife, right? <laughs> I did something different last night. I was like, you know what? We've been down this road a thousand times before. Sure. Tonight, I'm not going to respond. I'm not going to react, which really didn't aggravate the situation even more. But I was like, listen, it's going to be aggravated one way or the other. I'm just going to take a different path to this. And, we'll, and, and, and you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll see sort of the long term sort of results of that. But uh, I was very conscious of that. And that's the joke about what we're talking about right now, which is, you know, the problem with the unconscious is this bloody unconscious, right? Like mm -hmm. this is this is where we revert. One of the models that we teach in, in our programming is something called transactional analysis. That says your personality is made up of what is known as a parental ego state, an adult ego state, and a child ego state. Sure. Where things start to go wrong is the parent then speaks to the child, and then the child then responds back to your child. And next thing you know, you got two four-year-olds, which are actually grown adults, acting and behaving like four-year-olds each, right? Responding and reacting at a very unconscious level. Okay. You know, if I could just add to that just for a second, if you can, 
like, you know, as you're saying, like, you know, you were cognizant and aware and congratulations to you, right? When you're in the heat of it, it's not easy to do that. Right. right? So one of the things that I would tell people is that in the middle of the argument, you stop breathing, right? You're arguing, you're not breathing. Your diaphragm is contracted, your arms, your chest, everything's contracted. Just for a split second, if you can just remember, take a breath. Mm -hmm. If you just say, breathe. All of a sudden, now what's going to happen, that whole conversation is going to shift into a different tone because you're not going to run on that sympathetic tone. You're going to allow the parasympathetic to kick in and it's going to open the door for it. Now, you may still go back and fight it inside of it, but at least it becomes a new habit pattern that you're working on over time. Right. I'm going to tell you a story and you could use this and borrow it and just, just credit me because I actually learned it from an ex-partner, even though I shouldn't give him credit, but I'll give him credit as well. <laughs> the story is a story of change. And this is a story about Dr. T. And Dr. T walks out his house every single day, like he's done for 10 years. He walks down his driveway and he makes a right up the road. And you do this on Monday and you walk out the, uh, outside your house, you walk down the driveway, you make a right up the road. And as you walk up the road, bang, you fall in the hole. Oh, I didn't know there was a hole here. I've walked here a thousand times. There's never been a hole here. Anyway, next week, you walk out your house the same way you've done a thousand times before. You walk down your driveway. This time you got a little bit of pep in your step, right? You're in Miami, right? You've got mm -hmm. a little, little salsa, salsa music playing in the background. You walk down, you make a right, you walk up the street, bang, you fall in the hole again. You think, oh, I'm an idiot. I fell in the hole, right? This just happened to me last week. Week three, you know there's a hole. You walk out your driveway, you remember there's a hole, you make a right as you walk up the road, you look left, you forgot there was a hole, bang, you fall in the hole again, right? Oh, I'm an idiot now. Last week, I forgot there was a hole. This week, I knew there was a hole. Mm -hmm. Week four. This week, you go out, you get geared up. You go to, you go to your uh, hiking store, you get mountain climbing shoes, you get a <laughs> ladder, you get a hat, you get a flashlight, you get everything. You are walking up the road, you are prepared for the hole, you are ready for the hole, you are geared up for the hole, bang, you fall in the fucking hole again. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Week one, <laughs> week three, week four, you fall in the hole. All of a sudden, next week, you hop outside your house, you walk down your driveway. As you're about to make it a right, you stop, you take a breath, you recognize, and you remember that you fell in the hole four times and you make a left. And the That's moral right. of the story is in order for us to change, sometimes we got to fall in the hole a few times. I love that. It's absolutely true. It's, it's absolutely true. Right? Totally right. true. So tell me a little bit about why this is important for us as parents and leaders. I mean, in, in, in the work you do, why is it so important? I think it's essential, right? All human beings function from a state of their own identity, what I call their identity or their values. And anytime we're not congruent to who we are and our values, our nervous system is trying to give us feedback to get us back to our, our core values. It's trying to actually tell us who we are and what we do. So leaders are... You know, leadership is an interesting thing from a neurological perspective. Um, I look at, I, I have a, a program that I do called Neuro Leadership in Sevens, where you look at it and you say, okay, how do we reprogram our brain for actually leadership? And every one of us is a leader. I, I believe that every one of us is a leader in our highest values. And in our highest values, we will lead, we'll begin to the frontal cortex, we'll be objective, we'll, we'll know exactly what we're to do, and we'll have long term vision, which is what a leader does. But when we function from the amygdala, and do things from a place from, from a job, from something that we have to do, a necessity. We actually create ourselves and shorten our life and shorten our thinking span and function from our, our amygdala versus our frontal cortex, which has inspiration inside of it. So if you're a leader inside of it, you've got to look at it and say, is this what I'm inspired to do? Because if it's not what I'm inspired to do, then you are literally setting yourself up for depression, anxiety, all these symptoms we've already discussed today. Now, why that's important as a parent is I believe as a parent, you are a leader. And as a leader, parent, your job is to lead your children, to learn who they are, what their highest values are. I literally dropped my daughter off at college yesterday. And um, it was a, it was an amazing moment, right? And I thought about it when I came back, I sat down and I, I was just, you know, reflecting. And I thought about it, and I said, you know what, she knows what to do. She knows her highest values. She knows exactly what the feedbacks are. She knows exactly how the brain's going to work. I mean, she's going to study neuroscience as well. So that's, that's a whole different animal too. <laughs> She'll take over the family business. She, that's, she's like, dad, I want to do what you do. I said, hold on. I'm not done retiring yet. Right. <laughs> I'm like, it's not there yet. But, you know, she'll understand it. But like, I, I've, she knows what her highest values are. She knows what her identity is. And she knows like who she is. I think the biggest problem we have, especially as with parents and teenagers and children is that, Parents don't know who they are. That's why the work that you guys do, Greg, is so powerful, is that you teach people to know who they are. 
And once from that, they can actually help their children with that. So leadership is not sitting at the top of a CEO of a company. Leadership is a day-to-day -day process that we're doing with every single person we know in our interaction, I think. Mm -hmm. What do you think leaders are stressing out and what's creating anxiety for them in the work? You, you do a lot of work and you see a lot of these, these CEOs, executives. What's common among them? Is there a common sort of stressor? Is it the pressure of performing? Is it the, 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 the living up to the brand and the identity that they think they are? I'll tell you, it's twofold. It's trying to keep everybody happy and still keep performance going. It's really interesting if you stop and think about it, right? If you try to make everybody happy, like you can't perform. Like you have to sometimes let people go. You gotta let people get feel pain, all these things to, for growth to happen. But if we're always trying to make people happy, this is something I see consistently with CEOs all the time is that when I work with them, it's like, oh, they're trying to keep everybody in the company moving in a direction. They can't deal with challenge. They can't deal with the, the, you know, the criticism that's gonna come with it. As a leader, you have to be able to deal with criticism and support simultaneously. Like you've got to know that you're going to be opposed with everything you do and you're going to be challenged and supported with everything you do. And you're going to have both of those coming at you a hundred percent of your time. But as a leader, if you get addicted to the idea of more support than challenge and what you do is you simply limit your growth inside of that. So I think, but then trying to make everybody happy at the same time and perform, especially with the world, the way that it's going financially, like, that's a big quandary that that leaders have to face. Yeah, yeah. back to that positive thinking, right? It's not mm -hmm. just it's, it hasn't just affected sort of parenting and 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 call it society. It's affecting the corporate world, right? Oh, you know, not to you know maybe step on a wound here, but it is really the mind virus of of today's world, right? Right. I love the way you describe that mind virus. Hey, so sorry to interrupt and thank you for listening. I hope you're enjoying the show. If you like today's episode and you want to learn more about some of our programs, like the Better Leader Program that can change your life, go ahead and click the link below. It is. It's like it, it literally has infiltrated and infected, and I'll use that word just like that, infected society as a global scale and trying to make everybody happy and children can't navigate it. Like I have children, like, and it's, it's hard. I'll tell you what, like, Greg, you know, your kids are... Are, are probably more astute. My kids are more astute. But if you don't know this as a parent, like I have children that are 10, 12 years old right. and, you know, they're having suicidal thoughts and they're having depression thoughts and, and all this. And parents are like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. And, and they're getting put on these drugs to, to neurologically numb these brains mm -hmm. instead of realizing that thought is actually normal. Right. That thought is, believe it or not, even a suicidal thought is normal. Because if I, I've spoken across the world, and if I ask people, how many people in this room have had a suicidal thought? Every single person will put up their hand. Right. Because it's normal. It's a normal thought. But we, in society, because of dopamine, have said that you should not have these thoughts. These are the thoughts you should have, and these are the ones you shouldn't have. Well, if we shouldn't have them, why is everybody in society having them? Correct. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you're labeling it, you're describing it, you're telling people that. You know, it's funny, my son the other day, he has a friend that was um, not feeling well. <clears throat> and he's very into this friend and wants to be every, anyway, he's like, I'm not feeling well. And it was like, if they didn't say that, he wouldn't have said it. And my wife at the time was like, I don't know if he's doing, I'm like, babe, I, I really, I think he's fine, right? But it was, as you're describing it, it's yes, it's this, this, this assimilation effect, right? Which is this sort of group norm, which is, as we said, it's, 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 it's defined so much. Um, yeah, you know, we've created this mental health crisis. I don't think this mental health crisis has, has uh, come up naturally. I think it's, it's come up because of what we've said. We've tried to remove all the negative, stressful things. And I love what you said before about leadership, which is it's the good and the bad, it's the yin and the yang, it's mm -hmm. the, the, the sun and the moon. And that's that's, right. that's where you said like, having a depression thought or having anxiety, these are normal suicidal thoughts. It's, it's normal. And just to define suicidal thoughts, um, if you've ever thought of suicide, normal. If you're thinking of suicide continuously, it's a little bit of a different sort of challenge. Correct. Right? And, and, and thoughts. And that's where, where we want to make sure that there's a difference there. In fact, I just interviewed someone, um, uh, men's mental health, and he, he is diagnosed with this very specific type of suicide um, personality that says when he's facing stress, he's got one of three thoughts, deal with it, don't deal with it, kill himself. 
<laughs> and this is a very normal thing. And he's learned how to manage it, right? Because he's defined it and he's recognized it and he gets support and, and he deals with it. But that is very different than, than what we're describing here, right? You know, I've been on the verge of suicide twice. So, yeah. you know, when I was going through a massive divorce, I'm an Indian guy that, you know, Indian people don't get divorced. That's not what we do. It's not the, the norm for our culture. And, and I realized this. And every one of us, if you ask yourself this question, if you go, and I studied it because I was like, why am I here? What, how did I get here? And the only, from all of the deduction I can do, and I can't say this as a hundred percent statement, I can say, but I can say it as a strong 99.9%. .9%. Mm -hmm. The only reason we think about suicide is because we feel we're out of control in our life. And the only thing we have control of is taking our life. Mm -hmm. So that the mechanism to help harbor that and change that is realize where do I actually have control? Right. And we feel so out of control. Everyone's taking control. I have no control of my life. Really? You have all the control. You have control of your breath. You have control of what you're going to put in your mouth. You have control of where you're going to sleep. You have control of what clothes you're going to wear. Start with the little things. What do you have control over? Right. Then move to the bigger things. Sometimes like, and pardon me if I just go a little bit into this, if that's okay. okay. Like sometimes we look at it and say like, you know, maybe there's a big crisis going on. And you're like, I don't have a control on this crisis. Maybe you're going through a divorce and, you know, your wife or your husband's taking the kids away. And, or, you know, like there's some real stuff that happens in life. I'm not, and we want to address those things. But what if you said, hey, you know what? That's a big thing I don't have control of right now. What do I have control over? Mm -hmm. I have control over how I'm breathing. I have control of how I'm feeling. I have control of how my shoes I'm going to wear today. And that starts the process because the lack of control is where we feel the chaos breed. Take that chaos, calm that down, and then there's no need for the, the suicidal thought is a symptom. Right. It's a symptom. So just if that helps anybody on here, uh, that's just a mechanism to, to be able to help that maybe. No, that's awesome. Because what you're talking about is as, as one of our primitive needs is certainty, we, mm -hmm. which is control, right? Correct. That's why you see very sort of dominant personalities. They get angry and reactive when they're feeling they can't control the situation, right? Sure. Um, so, you know, feeling out of control and feeling chaotic, you know, back to it is, is grabbing control. And what we also know about suicide, which is for the audience, which is, it's a very rational decision. And what we're talking about here is when your amygdala switches off, that's sure. when suicide becomes a reality, right? Because your amygdala won't allow you to commit suicide. And that's where the thought goes into, no, I won't do it. Right. Um, but back to it, I love what you described, which is break it down to some of the small actions and the small things that I can deal with. I could deal with breathing. I can deal with sort of where am I going to have my next meal, right? Yeah. What color of shoes I'm going to wear. Break it down to the simplistic things because it's those smaller steps that lead into the larger steps. And what we talk a lot about is action creates the path. And, you know, if we're sitting stagnant and we're frozen, which is another survival sort of mode, all we're doing is perpetuating the um the stress and this is where our brain does amazing things and not amazing things where our brain has this wonderful ability to have this imagination to it in a positive way we could be creative and we can see things but this is the same brain that when in an anxiety state tends to build up mental models and pictures and perceptions and movies of how disastrous and chaotic life is going to be well the other thing right is if i could just add to it as we're talking about it is if you actually sat down and said, okay, here's my life, it's out of control. And you listed out 30, 40, 50 places where you do have control, that whole thing heals itself because the brain rebalances. Right, right. It rebalances Love inside that. that. So not to belabor on that point, but you know what? There's a lot of leaders who deal with that, a lot of leaders who feel out of control, a lot, a lot of senior managers from pressure from the you know the the board and, and stockholders, shareholders, like that, that all is a real thing. That's all part of life. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, over my years, I've come to appreciate uh, stress, right? Uh, stress is, uh, is one of the things in my life that has allowed me to move forward, right? Because yeah. I recognize it. I'm in the moment, I'm stressed. Okay, what do I want to change? What do I need to do? What action do I need to take? What decision do I need to make? What, where can I go? Because I know doing nothing is actually going to leave me in a lot worse position. Is, is anxiety and depression and stuff, is it genetic? You know, we've heard some of that, which is, you know, it gets handed down from, you know, father to son in this particular example. There is an epigenetic tag and a genetic tag around that and a genetic tag that does play a mechanism of that. Now, 
those also we can say are genetic, but they're more epigenetic. So just because you, like I, I like to sit and say, let, let me use a parallel to give you an example of this, okay? So I'm Indian, as I mentioned. My father is Indian as well, which means that he, like by default, eats really spicy food, right? <laughs> like just, that's what he does. And or at least he did at least. So I remember when I was 17 years old, I was getting some some uh, reflux and I was like, I was 17 years old. I was like, that's young. I went to the doctor and he said, well, you're gonna have, you're gonna have uh, ulcers and reflux issues because your dad did. And I thought about it and I said, I was 17 years old. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. Like I see my dad pour on all the peppers. I see him like, and I'm like what cause? He's like, well, spicy food, this and that. I'm like, okay. So if I stop eating, like I never really ate spicy food, but if I stopped it all, that means I get it. He's like, oh, you're still going to get it. Now I kid you not. And that was almost 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago here. I don't have acid reflux. I don't have ulcers. I don't have any of that. So my point in saying that is that when we say it's genetic, it's also epigenetic because we learn the behaviors that our parents did. If we're cognizant and aware enough to say, you know what, I want to make a different behavioral change. You change that tag, you change that code, you change all of that. You don't have to live that. That's where conscious choice and conscious will comes in to sit and say, hey, look, there is that. Now, there's the argument that some, you know, some leaders will say and some people will say that you are predisposed because of those genetic things. You are predisposed. I'm not saying no, right. but that doesn't mean that's the path you have to live. Correct. And what your work proves is that you can actually, you can change that neurologically because that's where it all starts, right? You you 100% can. I, uh, I was speaking to a, a world famous, I'm not going to say his name, um, person on methylation, methylation of the DNA. Okay, what's methylation of the DNA? Methylation, basically, it's taking off a component and it's taking off a DNA component. And it's actually the process of many people call aging in that process, right? Some people have heard the telomeres and that inside so the telomeres shorten. Methylation is literally where you take a methyl group and it adds to the DNA. Now, what that is, it's a stressor, right? For, for the purposes of this discussion without getting into the carbon molecules and all that, what it is, it's a stressor. It's the sympathetic nervous system turned on inside that. And methylation adds age yeah. inside of it. I said, so what about, so many people are, are born with these break pathways that aren't there. So we take things like methyl B vitamins to help break that balance out, okay? Um, and you can do lots more research on that with the MTHFR um, genetic code, things like that. You can go look that stuff up if, if you're interested for your listeners. But I asked them the question about what about acetylation? And he's like, well, what's acetylation? Yeah. Acetylation is the parasympathetic side when you put an acetyl group to balance the methyl group. And so when that happens, the brain and body balances. Here's the work that from everything I've discussed and talked about over the years, the one thing I've learned is that the brain and body is trying to get back to a state of balance, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to find its way to get to homeostasis, to that state of balance in our mind, our body are working as one to try and turn the whole unit as one person, as one thing in the balance, in a balanced state. I guess that's, that's, so when you, you know, I was just, I was picturing like, you know, uh, uh, a perfect human being, right. And the perfect human being is, is, is completely balanced and everything. Yeah. Right. They sit in that, that, uh, you know, I often describe it uh, in communication skills and personality where I, I use the teeter totter example. Right. People don't know what a teeter totter is. You might know what it is because you're seesaw. Thinking, yeah, a seesaw. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, well, you're, you're, um, but, um, you know, what tends to happen is it's always doing this, it's always sort of rocking back and forth. But where things become imbalanced in relationships and leadership and in stress and emotions is where the teeter totter is now at an angle of a seesaw. And yeah. it's, it's, it's teetering like this. We're always going to be teetering back and forth, but we, we, we need to get that level going. And that could be physical and mind. That could be emotions and relationships. That could be, you know, workload. And by the way, what we're not talking about is where we, we, we see societal uh, work home life balance bullshit, right? This is, like, <laughs> oh, you know, I, I put in eight hours today. I need eight hours off, right? This is, this is balance in, in your activity and your thinking and your, in your mindset and your emotions and your actions and your feelings and in, in, in that unconscious and conscious ability. That's right. There's no question. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Dr. T, Dr. Rewire, you're amazing. Um, uh, 
just before we come to the last question uh, mm-hmm. of the episode, because we're coming to the top of the hour, time flies so fast, man. And I can spend oh, that was quick. You. But um, what do you think we need to th- uh, really be mindful of over the next couple of years, 2023, 2024, you know, we're, we're, we've got the future ahead of us. What do we need to do as parents? What do we need to do as leaders in order to navigate the upcoming waters? You know, my answer may not sound as um, simple, it, or it's not as sexy. That's probably a better word, right? <laughs> it's not maybe as PC, but I would have to sit and say, if we're going to make a collective difference in people, it's going to start with individuals knowing who they are. So know thyself, know who you are and what you're about and what your real identity is, because it's in all the work I've done, your values and your identity, knowing who you are, what you stand for and what's real to you, right? Not what other people tell you to do, what not what other people, you know, what you subordinate or what you sub- subordinate your life. You're one thing, as Gary Kelly would call it, your dharma, as the Eastern Vedics would call it, right? Like, it, like, what is the one thing that you do that you're designed to? And zone in on that. Zone in on that. When COVID hit, like, I took all my business associates, all my clients, and we found that one thing and we hammered in, and that's all we focused on. Because when you focus in that, your brain goes from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. Your oxygenation goes up. Your glucose goes up. You don't need to eat all the time. Your function goes up. Your long-term inspiration goes up. Your oxygenation goes up into your entire body. Everything turns on. So I think, you know, I think we haven't seen the end of COVID, in my opinion. Right. I don't think we've seen the end of it. But I still think that we're going to have the aftermath of it for several years. And inside of that, there's going to be a lot of people who don't have that governance of the mind that are going to have to deal with a lot of chaos and mental health is going to be one of those for sure. But I think the secret to it is focused on your highest values and your identity more than anything else. It's amazing. And what you're not saying is, you know, find your passion and follow it. It's, it's operate with your purpose and your values. And we see a lot of this work. I'm doing a lot of this work in teams now, which is really defining purpose and, and um, values. Well, if you even like people, you know, like the passion stuff, right? Like passion means to suffer. Right. People don't realize it. it means to suffer. Right. So what, like, are the, the etymology of our words are so important, but people just live with passion or do things with passion. No, you don't want to be passionate. You want to be inspired because inspiration brings oxygen and further life advancement. Right. And motivation comes after that inspiration, not before. That's right. right. That's awesome. right. All right. We come to the last uh, question of the episode and you kind of already answered it, but maybe you could sort of expand and, and, and continue. You know, the, the, the podcast is all about what we could, uh, what, what could we do to be better humans? And at the end of the episode, we want to ask amazing thought leaders like yourself, what do you think we could all do to be better humans tomorrow? I think, as I said, man, just, you know, focus on your highest values, focus on what you do better than anyone else, because the ripple effect of that will give permission to everyone else to do that. Right. When we all live in a um, blinded environment, then we're all going to be blind. But it's going to take a leader to stand up and sit and say, this is what I am. This is who I am. And when you do, you give permission to other people to become and do amazing things. And when you do that, then all of a sudden the ripple effect of this just cascades. And it's not about doing more things in life. It's about being more in life. And the only way to be more is to actually be more of yourself. So that's why I say that it's the most important thing you can do. Amazing. That's amazing. Dr. T, a.k.a. Dr. Rewire, thank you for taking the time today. Uh, Just for the audience, where could they learn more about you? How can they follow you on social? Um, You have a book out too, right? Yeah, there's a book out, Chasing Success. I wrote that several years back. It's a a fictional tale. It's a short, it's a quick read. It's not a short book. It's a quick read, but it'll take you three, four hours to read it. Um, People have said that that one book has changed their trajectory of their relationships. Um, but it's, it's a great book and it's a, it's a fun read inside of that as well. You can go to drrewire.com or all my social handles are dr.rewire. I don't know, all these social media places that people are. (laughs) Someone gave me the handle dr.rewire. Yeah, no, you can absolutely find Dr. Rewire. I found you pretty easily. I'm following you now. Um, and of course, for the audience, we are going to put all of your website and your social handles and the info in your book in the footnotes. So, uh, go check them out. And if you want to do some work with, uh, Dr. T reach out, you're an amazing human being. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, brother. Appreciate everything you do for the world and everyone listening as well. Thank you so much. 
Amazing. All right. To the audience, if you like today's episode, don't forget to like it. Don't forget to subscribe to it and don't forget to share it. And we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for listening today. And if you enjoyed today's episode, you're going to love the next one.